Hello, everyone. Welcome to Custody Matters Live. My name is Danica Jones and my wonderful co-host, Wendy Perry here. Thank you for joining us. Wendy, it's just you yes. and me today. I know, it's just you and me today, but um, I love it when we have a guest. Our guests are always great, a lot of really great information, and they, they're always very interesting. But I think it's good once in a while if you and I catch up and, and share with everyone what we've been doing. So we're going to do that today. So we get to catch up and we've both had some recent experiences in family court that I think our viewers will be interested in hearing about. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it was it uh, most recently what we before we went on air, we were talking about the different topics of judges and their impact on the outcomes of family uh, court hearings, as well as the ad litems and, and the, different, the different parties that play, the professionals who are impacted by these families and these families are impacting. Um, I guess we can go ahead and uh, I'll give you my experience recently. I was asked to be, uh, for, to give expert testimony at a custody hearing. And it was really clear to me that um, mom was, everything was stacked against mom. Uh, and that's who I was speaking on behalf of. And what the, what I could see is not only it seemed like the, the judge had sided with dad already, uh, like, and, but also there was a guardian ad litem and actually an attorney guardian ad litem assigned to their family. And the, when in conversation with the ad litem, I could tell she already made her decision. She already made her decision against mom on behalf of dad. Uh, game over. Now dad has a paid attorney. He also has a free attorney on his side. And, and she was just left with, oh my gosh, my, you know, my life is flashing before me and I have nothing that I can do about it. So were you able to get on the stand and uh, give some testimony or did they keep you off the stand? They kept me off the stand. Um, I stayed back. I left the courtroom so that they could finish up their hearing. And, and then at that point, uh, her attorney introduced me to the ad litem attorney. And I had a conversation. Uh, and then sometimes you can actually have make a little bit more headway when you're outside of the courtroom, because inside of the courtroom, there's all of this posturing that goes on and, and you can't really share what it is that you're an expert about. They just, because the party that doesn't want you to share that could hurt their client, they're, they're constantly interrupting and, and you're not able to really say what needs to be said. So how did the judge respond? It sounds like the, this um, attorney was very biased and it was really blatant. So did the judge just let them say and, and do whatever they wanted to say and do? I mean, how did the judge react to this uh, bias? It was, it was my observation. I'm in, I'm in, you know, the gallery watching everything uh, transpire and the judge was just, his demeanor was no patience for mom and mom's attorney mm. um, and just wanted to get this hearing uh, going, didn't want to even consider what it is that I had to contribute. And so I never even got on the stand. And in fact, the hearing got continued. So again, nothing is, was really, no headway was made because you just, they drag it on and on and on. And, and that I know in that situation, that's part of the tactics. If you don't think you're going to win uh, a hearing and get any headway, you just figure out how you can drag it on and on and on. Um, so, I was wondering when you were telling about this experience, has the mom's attorney tried to get that court appointed attorney removed from the case because they're biased? Or I, do you know? I don't know. I haven't had any communication with them at this point because I don't, uh, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, you know, I try to do what I can to, to speak uh, some wisdom into the situation with the attorney and, and with the ad litem. And, um, and what I mean by that is what's really great about my role as um, with a background in mediation and 
uh, coaching and stuff like that is the advice I give, it really doesn't, it applies to both sides, whether you're playing dirty or you're kind of being victimized. Uh, my advice is the same because the court's role, I am a firm stand that the court's role is the ground in the midst of the storm. The, the court should have like a prime directive that um, we are a stand for both parents having access to the child and the child having access to both parents. And as long as they have, that's what their directive is, all of these circumstances and emotions and stuff like that can blow in the wind as long as you keep grounded in that. Um, but unfortunately, in the state of Florida, you know, they have legislation that has, has Florida a shared parenting state. Um, so in theory, the legislators are, have already laid the groundwork for equal, uh, equal access and, and for the children to have a relationship with both parents equally. However, judges can override all of that and it's their mentality it's their view um that that colors that situation and they i i really i'm getting to the point where i'm like it's it comes down to the judges i don't even blame the attorneys because the attorneys are hired they're hired to to fight for their clients uh, rights and utilize the laws that are available to them to to convince the judge that they are more right than the next person. So it's really ultimately the judge has got to say um, to be the ground and say no 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 we're not we're not giving you all everything and marginalizing a parent. We're a stand for that that child. So and it's the same thing with in dependency court. Dependency court in the state of Florida is what dictates the foster system when a child is removed from a home because of abuse or neglect. Uh, the, the court system is established such that the child can if they do whatever it takes to reunify child with parent. Mm -hmm. Even if the child is abused or you know, the, they've abused them and neglected them, uh, they give them the you know, the classes, the rehabilitation to, so that they can restore the relationship with the child. That's the prime directive of dependency court, not so in family court. Right, which is surprising to people who have not been to family court because before you have an experience with family court, you assume that that is what they do, is that their primary goal and focus is to you know, keep the family together and to, um, to, you know, build those relationships or, you know, at least facilitate the repair of those relationships if there is an issue. Gosh, you said several things that are just hitting home with me right now. <laughs> um, so I, I hardly know where to start. Um, but um, did you want to say anything else before I kind of comment on some of the things that you said? No, go ahead. And okay. Yeah. Well, um, you know, you mentioned that they kept you off the stand and I recently had the same experience and it's such a shame when they want to keep a co-parenting or parental alienation expert or whatever you want, whatever you call yourself, but it's such a shame when they want to keep you off the stand. Um, for example, I recently went with someone to court and uh, they wanted to get me on the stand not as a witness to the facts of the case because I don't know all the facts of the case so I, I could not have um, been testifying on behalf of either parent right so I, I wouldn't have been you know pro dad or pro mom but I just would have gotten on the stand um, to explain what parental alienation is what proper co-parenting means um, but because I walked into the courtroom with one of the parents the other uh, parents attorney immediately that was our first order of business was to keep me off the stand you know and it was such a shame because I, I watched the whole hearing and there were some things that if I had been able to explain about co-parenting and parental alienation I think there are a few things I would have shared that might have sort of been to that other side's advantage. Um, so it's just really a shame because 
it, it's to everyone's benefit, I believe it's to everyone's benefit, especially the child, and that's what we're supposed to be focusing on, if they would allow us to get on the stand and just explain what co-parenting is, what parental alienation is, what alienating behaviors are, and to explain why it is important for the child to have, uh, to be able to receive the love and support of both parents. It's just a shame, but like you said, it has so much to do with the, you know, posturing, and, and I agree with what you said, too, about the judges. Ultimately, it all comes down to the judge's discretion, and the attorneys are um, representing their clients, and they've got a fiduciary duty to do so. I mean, they have to zealously represent their clients. They're hired to do that, and they actually have a duty and an obligation to represent their clients. So I, I understand a lot of people think that attorneys are just, you know, evil creatures, <laughs> but they're really not. I mean, they're, they're doing a job now. They're like everybody else. Some are good and some are bad and some are nice and some are not so nice, but uh, it really does come down to the judge ultimately in those cases. And also, <laughs> you, I, and I don't want to go on about this part too much, but you talked about shared parenting and equal parenting, and um, Texas is the same way, and a lot of people don't realize this, and they don't understand it, that it is in our Texas Family Code that we are a shared parenting state, um, but to my knowledge, in all of the states where shared parenting bills have passed, there's, it still says that it comes down to the judge making the ultimate decision based on the best interest of the child, whatever that means to the judge. So we have a lot of work to do in, in those areas of uh, shared parenting um, and equal parenting uh, legislation. Yeah, and you know, something interesting is that uh, both of us are experts, not only in our own own personal experiences, just in parental alienation and, and describing what it is and what's best for a child, just because of the work that we've done for so many years. And yet you still have judges, you go in as an expert witness and they're gonna knock you down. They're gonna knock you down based upon your education because like in, in my background is, is uh, my degree is in education, not mental health. And it, I was, cons I wrote the family stabilization curriculum that was approved by the state of Florida and approved in 42 states. But, and I go into a courtroom and they're like, oh, she doesn't have a mental health degree. <laughs> she, she, we will, we'll give her the, the, the kudos for having written the program that teaches thousands of people every year uh, around co-parenting co practices, but she's not good enough for an expert witness. Yeah, we didn't even get that far. <laughs> we, didn't even, we didn't even get that far. Um, they didn't talk about credentials or licenses or anything. Um, the, the one attorney just right off the bat said, you know, I, I, she wanted to argue that there would not be any expert witnesses, period. And the judge was like, okay. And that was it. I mean, there was not even any discussion of it, you know. Um, so I had a similar experience um, recently, uh, like I said, I went to family court with someone and I really just went as moral support. Um, and people ask me to do that quite a bit. And so I went as moral support and I also, uh, I'm interested to watch family court hearings, um, because of the work that I do. And if I had been someone who just happened to stumble into this courtroom, I would have thought that, the one parent had two attorneys because there were two attorneys sitting together. Clearly, it appeared to be representing this one parent and very, very zealously representing this one parent. And, but turns out that that's not, that's not the case. Uh, one of the attorneys um, was, it, it was a dad and I, I hesitate to say the gender because we know it's not a gender issue, but the, uh, there was a rep attorney representing the dad, and then it appeared that the dad had another attorney, two attorneys, but one of the attorneys was a court-appointed amicus attorney, and this court-appointed amicus attorney was so 
so biased and so aligned with the dad. Um, and like I said, it was like he had two attorneys. And a couple of things is that and I'll just say how it works here in Texas because I think it might vary from state to state. But here in Texas, we have court-appointed amicus attorneys and court-appointed ad litem attorneys. A lot of people don't realize that there is a difference between the two. They think amicus attorney and ad litem attorneys are the same, but they're not the same. So here in Texas, if you have a court-appointed ad litem attorney, an ad litem represents the child, whatever the child says they want, no matter how bizarre or weird it might be. Like if the child says, you know, I want to go live in the zoo, <laughs> you know, the ad litem attorney is like, okay, I got to bring it to the court, you know, this, you know, your honor, this child wants to live in the zoo, so we should let them live in the zoo, like, that's a really crazy example, but I'm just saying, the ad litem is supposed to really represent the child's wishes, whatever the, their wishes are, so if the child says, I want to live with mom, or I want to live with dad, the ad litem is supposed to um, advocate for that, but an amicus attorney, um, in Texas is supposed to be uh, neutral and unbiased and do fact finding. And based on that neutral, unbiased fact finding, make a recommendation to the court uh, about um, the case. And they are not supposed to align with or favor or represent um, either parent or the child. They're supposed to be neutral and unbiased. And unfortunately, though, that's not how they operate. And um, it's just what I saw in court a few weeks ago was an example uh, of how bad that situation is. This amicus attorney was so biased and not just biased and aligned with one parent, but uh, she was flat out harassing and badgering the mom when the mom was on the stand. I mean, it was it was horrible. It was so out of control. Her behavior was so inappropriate. And the judge didn't do anything. Mm. Didn't do anything to stop. And the, and the one attorney did actually say badgering the witness. And she was badgering the witness. It was just really, really horrible. Horrible to see. And here is something that I want people to know uh, about one of the major problems that we have in the family court system, at least here in Texas, again, it could be different in other states, but um, this amicus attorney was a family court judge, and she got voted out by the people, okay? So here in Texas, a judge can get voted off the bench. In other words, we the people are saying, we don't want you to be a judge anymore. We don't want you to have this job anymore, okay? So they get, she got voted out. The people said, we don't want you to be a judge anymore. But she actually is still acting like a judge because she's an extension of the court. She's an extension of the judge by being a court-appointed amicus attorney. And she can also, I mean, if, if she chooses, if people invite her to, she can come and she can fill in when judges are on vacation or take a leave of absence. So here in Texas, you can vote somebody out. You can say, we don't want you anymore to be a judge, but they can still act as a judge. And I think that that is a huge problem that we've got to change. If the people say, we're voting you out, you know, we're the taxpayers and we don't feel like you're good at this job anymore, or we don't want you at this job anymore, then they should no longer be allowed to do that job. And, and they get around it here in Texas by coming in and you know, visiting, filling in for vacation, and also being court-appointed amicus and ad litem attorneys. And one more thing, I know I'm really going on a lot, but uh, I'm really passionate about this, is their attorneys. So I, they're not qualified to even, in my opinion, they're not qualified to make those decisions. You know, this, this is someone who was, uh, you know, she's an attorney and she was a judge, but she's not necessarily trained to, to make those assessments of what is best for the child. And, and her behavior was so inappropriate and the judge just let her go on. They are so tranquilized in the court system, it seems, to, to the impact that they have on these families, on ultimately the children. Um, you know, they, I know I'm 
also a guardian ad litem in the dependency system. And when I have gone to represent a foster child, whatever child I'm assigned to in the courts, I, my voice holds way more weight than these caseworkers who have had to visit these homes because of abuse and neglect, who pull these, you know, my voice uh, holds huge amount of weight. And therefore, I've got a profound responsibility to that child. And knowing that whatever I say to that judge, that judge will do. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, we see it here all the time where the judges, they don't put the brakes on like an amicus that is out of control, like the one that I, I witnessed. And, and it was very, very, very similar to my case. I was, my mind was kind of blown. I was like, wow, this is like, um, deja vu, <laughs> you is know, it going it, like now we get to choose to be family advocates. We choose to go into these courtrooms to help these people because we remember what it was like to be those people. And it is, it's not cer certainly, sometimes it gives me a little bit of like, um, like deja vu mm -hmm. of, of the trauma that I experienced every time I went into court. And um, so. Yeah, and, and it's shocking. And I, and I think, again, that people don't realize it. I certainly would not have imagined it before it happened to me. And so I think if, if you're not, if you have not been a family court litigant or you don't somehow work in a field that's related to it or connected to it, you really don't, you can't imagine. And, and it doesn't make sense. Um, so we, we've got some real serious changes that need to happen. And, and I, when you go and you observe these hearings, you, you get to see a lot of that. Yeah. You know, uh, so last year, about a year ago, I went to a DC conference for, for mediators and, and we were speak and they were judges that were speaking, uh, about the family court situation and stuff like that. And I'm sitting there listening to all this conversation and like this giant elephant in the room that they're not addressing. And it's all about this, this thing that I'm a stand for is, you know, pay, these parents in family court should be given the same consideration as these parents in dependency court at the very least, you know, why are they, why is their, um, their ability to marginalize a parent or completely cut them out of a child's life in family court who's who never, this parent has never been found guilty uh, of, of anything, abuse or neglect. Um, but yet in family, you know, just like I said, it's just like a totally different way of, of managing the courts and, and doing what doing, it's doing a disservice to the children in family court. And it's called family court, but yet when you go and you see how it operates, it, it feels very anti-family. And I think that is what is really shocking to people is that it, it sounds like it's to help your family, but you get in there and it's, it's really not, not so helpful to your family. But, you know, I think it's, there's always, I think over the generations, there have been things that have been completely acceptable. Like when, when we had, uh, we had, minority schools and we had white schools. We had different fountains and different bathrooms and it was completely acceptable for that era in, in American history. Now it's deplorable. It's disgusting to, to think of two races being treated so differently. Um, so it's just something that we have to get in, interrupt that conversation and say, listen guys, it's really obvious. It's really obvious what you need to do. Um, and it really starts with the judges. Yeah, I agree. Well, um, we're almost out of time, aren't we? Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just uh, make a little announcement that um, I am going to start sending out uh, a monthly newsletter. And so uh, I would like to ask our viewers if they would visit my website and sign up to get my newsletter. And my website is wendyjperry.com. So on any page on my website in the upper right hand corner, uh, all you have to do is put in your name and email address and boom, you're in. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. 
So the project that I'm working on is to have is a global conversation. So uh, there's a group of people in Israel that I've been having meetings with every week in regards to because in, in Israel, it, there haven't been there's not been that many generations that have gone by that they've experienced divorce and separation. So there's not a lot of support for parents who are separated and the youth, the children, there's no support for them as well. So, uh, so what I've been creating with this group is doing some, some moderated chat rooms um, that are based upon language. So our start, since I'm working with people whose primary language is Hebrew and working with that community. And, and of course this, it, this support group will be trained by, uh, will be led by trained moderators and dealing and based on a, like a 10 week curriculum. So that's what I'm hoping to uh, implement by the end of the summer, uh, having our chat rooms, uh, moderated chat rooms to support people. And eventually we, if we can, we can train a moderator in all the major languages and have a different room for each one of them. That is so exciting and yay for a global project because this is a global problem. It, it happens everywhere. So that's really exciting. Yeah, it's not a, an American phenomenon for sure. I mean, as we've seen mm -hmm. in April being Parental Alienation Awareness Month, there's, that's when we really start seeing all of the, the, the country represented and they're experiencing the same thing. So. Absolutely. Well, it was great chatting with you. It's great chatting, always great <laughs> chatting with you. And um, and if any of if if any of this that we've talked about speaks to you, uh, please reach out with uh, to us on Messenger on the the Facebook page that you're watching this on, and um, and we will see you again next week. Oh, next week, Who's our guest. Oh, next week. We've got a really special guest. Next week, our guest on Custody Matters Live is going to be Dr. Jennifer Harmon. So excited to have Dr. Harmon on. Yeah, she did a TED Talk. Uh, I watched, that's, that's, her TED Talk is what I've integrated into my co-parenting curriculum. And, um, and it is just so amazing the way that she takes the gender out of the conversation and makes it so easy to see that you can make a difference. It doesn't require one, both people, both ex-spouses to be, to be part of the solution. It only takes one to, to change the direction of the co-parenting situation. Yeah, she um, does a lot of great work and research, not just on parental alienation, but some other dynamics that are definitely related to alienating behaviors. So I'm, I'm not going to go into detail, but I'm really excited to talk with her about all of the things that she studies and that she teaches about at um, Colorado State University. So awesome. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, that's all we have for you today. Thank you for joining us for Custody Matters Live. Uh, and we will see, see you again next week.